Grace and peace to you, United Church, and welcome to worship this Sunday. Today is Palm Sunday, and uh, I think we've all experienced something of a Palm Sunday. Kids running through the church with waving palms, we decorate the church with palms, and uh, we want to try and capture today a little of what it meant in the first century um, Jerusalem, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the donkey. Um, I've, I'm wearing my dressing gown tonight uh, as I record it for Sunday and this uh, it, it's something interesting because um, it would be surprising for somebody to arrive in church in their pajamas and uh, so I want to talk a little bit about surprising today. The scripture we're going to be looking at is from Matthew 21. It's part of the Gospels we've been reading. And it has a little of the red, red letter edition in it. Now, uh, it's good that you've joined us worship, on worship today at United Church. And uh, lovely to have you look at our Easter services. There's an advert for them. We have a um, get-together on Thursday and then on Friday morning. And then there are services happening in our Kaimander Chapel in, uh, over the weekend. And then on Sunday morning, sunrise service will be at uh, one of our farms, the Summer Hill Farm, and you're welcome to join us there for the sunrise service at 6.30. So looking forward to Easter weekend and the great celebration of the Lord's resurrection. As we do this, let's come before the Lord in prayer. Holy Father, thank you for this season of the church. Thank you for the season it is based on of the Passover. Thank you that over the next two weeks, we get to celebrate everything about the fulfillment of what Jesus came to earth for. And so, Father, walk with us through this time as we walk with Jesus through the passion and the resurrection. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our first reading this morning is from Zechariah chapter 9 verses 9 to 10. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Our New Testament reading comes from Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 to 11. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell him that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. This is the word of the Lord. May he bless to us the reading of his word. Amen. So we pray that the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Now, I talked about it being surprising and uh, the reason for me wearing my dressing gown. Remember COVID and uh, during the lockdown of COVID, how we would um, put on a smart shirt and go to our Zoom meetings, but we'd be wearing our pajama pants and slippers. And uh, I've done that even recently where I've become comfortable with sitting at a Zoom meeting with a smart shirt on already dressed for bed and um, my dressing down, gown pulled down around my waist. 
And uh, it, it just is something we would not have done before 2020. We, we even got up and dressed up when we sat uh, working at our home office. And so things have changed. Everything changed in 2020 in so many ways. Now, um, I want to look at the story of the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. And first of all, just to talk about that title that the NIV gives it. Um, because so often we talk about a triumph, but there's almost an irony in the way in which this title is given to this text. Because they approach the city of Jerusalem from Bethpage and the Mount of Olives, and Jesus sends the disciples ahead of him to, to procure some transport for the day. They uh, then clearly come back with the donkey and its colt, and Jesus begins to ride into Jerusalem. Just a little, little bit of context. Um, John's Gospel shares with us that just before this, Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. And uh, it led the leaders of the Jewish temple to set about killing him. They, they made plans to kill him after that resurrection moment, which is in itself ironic because here is one who brings life, who gives life, who raises to life, and they choose to kill him, the very source of life. Well, that's before the story, and just after the story in Matthew's Gospel and John's Gospel, um, it's the story of Jesus entering the temple and overturning the tables of the money changers. Uh, we do get a picture, although none of the Gospels talk about it, of Jesus um, engaging in an act of uh, violence at this point, indignant about the way in which the temple is treated. Well, we'll talk more about that on another day, but um, this, these events surrounding this entry into Jerusalem are events which would have provoked severe reaction from the leaders of the Jewish temple. But here he comes into Jerusalem, and Matthew, who has done this throughout his gospel, says of the event that it took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. And um, one of the com commentaries that I, I love to read is a comment commentary written by a Jewish man who became a Christian, and uh, it's called Matthew presents Yeshua, um, prophet and king. And as he presents this Yeshua, he presents him as the new Moses, one who fulfills that prophecy from Deuteronomy, I will raise up for myself a prophet like Moses. And so Jesus is presented by Matthew as the new Moses, as the new lawgiver, as the new prophet. And uh, it's shown throughout the book of Matthew how he fulfills the prophecies of the Old Testament. The disciples did what Jesus told them. They went and stole the donkey. Oops, sorry, they went and, and procured the donkey, um, clearly with the permission of the owner. And uh, Jesus jumped on the, the colt of the donkey and then rode down the Mount of Olives into Jerusalem. Now, the Mount of Olives is um, a hill more than a mountain. The, you know, the, the Englishman walks up a hill and comes down a mountain. Well, in this case, he'd walk up a hill and come down a hill. It's not very high, but it does overlook Jerusalem, and he rides down towards the gate to Jerusalem, the gate to the Temple Mount. Now, when he does this, the people begin to worship him. And I want to I want to just take the picture a little bit from the other Gospels, um, as well as from Matthew's Gospel. Now, Matthew's Gospel presents the story quite simply, um, whereas the other Gospels present the story a bit more fully and talk about Jesus' re Jesus reaction. So we have the people's reaction in Matthew. The people worship. They sing this this hymn they would have sung on any other Passover, and they worship Hosanna to the son of David. Now, Passover was a time rich in Messianic ex expectation. The hope at Passover was that there would be a new exodus, a new liberation of God's people. And so they, they sing this hymn as Jesus rides his donkey down the mountain. And the, and the other Gospels 
talk about Jesus' response, not just the worship, but Jesus' response of, of um, compassion. He weeps for this city of Israel. At that moment in the feast of the Passover, it would be filling up with people from all over. A little bit like what we read at Pentecost when we read about all these different peoples come from all over, come to enjoy the feast. And the this um, this multitude of people who had descended on Israel would have given it a, a, a real sense of being all peoples, all nations coming to Israel, a little bit like the prophecy of Isaiah. You know, all peoples will come up to Zion. And Jesus looks over this, this kind of representation almost of the world, and he weeps and he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I have longed to gather you as a hen gathers its chicks. And um, the compassion of Jesus, obviously shown in other places of the Gospels, encapsulated here in this, in this moment as he rides into Jerusalem for the long time, last time. Remember, entering Jerusalem, never to leave again at this um, moment. And as, as he rides into Jerusalem, this commotion begins to happen around him and these people start to shout Hosanna to the son of David. Now, did they know he was the this, this son of David? Did they have an idea that he was a Messiah? Well, I'm not sure. Perhaps they wanted to make him a Messiah, a, a kind of warrior king. But the the point really is that as he comes into Jerusalem and these people worship, they capture one side. Their worship is proclaiming their impression of who God is. We do it in worship. And something I've become quite aware of recently in our worship is we, we sing these songs of adoration. You know, glorious God, um, how great is our God. Um, glorious things of you are spoken. Um, to God be the glory, great things he has done. And we sing these wonderful, rousing songs of worship. And yet we as God's people come into church carrying heavy burdens. From day to day in my job, I come across people with pain, people carrying um, the pain of the past, pain of loss, pain of disease and lost years of their life. Um, people with low self-esteem or having struggled with either neurological issues or psychiatric issues their whole life. And this is the kind of pain we bring into church. And yet in as we walk in the doors, instead of, you know, as like the the student returning, they're all going home from, to holidays now, they return from home and instead of like a student throwing their bag down and collapsing on the bed in a heap and just sleeping, um, we come into church and we feel we've got to just be happy. We've got to, you know, yeah, yeah, it's all good. And and that's the kind of impression you get from these people. They, they see Jesus riding down the mountain and it may be appropriate to be joyous because there is this this son of David, the Messiah, entering Jerusalem, but I'm not sure they get that. But this, this jubilation, which is only half the story, when we come to worship, sometimes I feel like we only catch half the story. The other side of the story is the pain that we bring. I sp spoke to a young couple this week um, who are carrying immense pain because the, the Christians around them uh, are are re reacting to the events around them in a way which is just lacking in compassion. And they're feeling pain because of the, the tension in their community. And we carry this all the time to less or greater degrees. Now, Jesus' response to this is that there is just pain in Jerusalem. And one of the other stories tells of Jesus the Pharisees standing around skeptically in this place of worship, watching this dynamic going on and being bitter about it and saying, you know, you've got to tell them to stop worshipping. And Jesus says, well, if I stop, then the very stones will cry out in worship. And, uh, I mean, this is just a reality. When God enters our lives, there, there is a response of worship. But what we need to understand is as we worship and as we dialogue with God in worship, God responds in compassion and God comes to us and meets us at the point of our pain. There's 
a song that we've recently um, sung in church, and it's called All the Poor and Powerless, All the Sad and Lonely. Um, and the, the message of the story is that these will come to the Lord. They will come and meet the Lord. And what begins as sad and lonely will be turned to the Bride of Christ, where the Bride comes together and sings songs of worship. Now, what, do I, what am I trying to say in all of this? Because it's, a, it, it, it's an interesting uh, text, which has been preached in so many different ways. But I think what I'm trying to say is, as we approach worship, as we come into worship, and perhaps you want to do that as you come into worship um, the next time you're there, at church, or maybe just privately, is to come with this reality that the life of a Christian is a dichotomy. It's, it, it has these two elements to it. The one is that we're drawn in worship to God, and the other is that there is the reality of the pain for which we need God's compassion and care. And I think we get it a little back to front as we worship because we come to worship feeling like we have to find these words to express who God is. In other words, we have to try and conjure up in our minds an idea of who God is and we try and look for words. And I find myself sometimes in writing prayers looking for words like justice and righteousness and beauty and eternal creator God and all these words which which just are beautiful. But unless we acknowledge, unless we own the, the pain for which Jesus wept, we cannot truly understand. We can never truly become um, worshippers of the living God. Because unless we see ourselves as truly needing the living God, our worship will always lack the authenticity of one who comes on their knees begging God for relief in this world, whether it's for ourselves or for our friends or our families. I would love for us as a community and for maybe you're watching this and, and you're, um, you're not in Stellenbosch per se, but somewhere else in the world. I would love for us as Christians to begin to walk around with open eyes as Jesus did as he rode down the mountain and to see the pain around us and to think about how we can express our compassion, our Christ-like compassion for the lost and lonely in our worship. And our worship can be become a conversation where we begin in this place of a brokenness and then like a student dumping its bag, his bag or her bag at the door, collapsing on the bed, we fall into the, the beautiful and compassionate grace of a loving father. I, I love that picture, that I come with brokenness. And in my brokenness, I understand that my need of the father. And so I fall into him. And I'm... I encourage you that as you worship, that you use real language. How do you truly feel about your own pain and the pain of the, of the world around you? And I truly believe that as we begin to own our own pain, we will, and the brokenness of the world around us, that we'll truly be able to fall into the embrace of God. It is only when we truly look at the cross that we find a God worth worshipping, for this is a God who gave everything to take upon himself the pain of the world. May you worship a saviour who carries the pain of the world and through tears proclaim how great thou art. Amen. Father, may we worship you in a real conversation in which we take into account fully the brokenness of this world in which we live and the
extent to which Christ suffered for it. And Jesus' resurrection bringing hope for a life beyond it. And then an explosive recognition of the Lamb who was slain to take away the sin of the world, seated at the right hand of the Father, the Eternal One shrouded, hidden in light. Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.